Monday, July 6th. Yes. Happy after 4th of July. Welcome to another episode of Let There Be Talk. It is a brand new episode. Like every Monday for the last nine years, popping out the rock comedy and handmade goodies for you. Speaking of handmade, this episode is brought to you by the king of the handmade mattresses, Avocado Green Mattresses. Yes, a new sponsor, Avocado Green Mattresses, is here. Go to avocadogreenmattress.com and get yourself a brand new mattress. Uh, I'll tell you what, this is a husband and wife team that were looking for a green, natural, yet affordable mattress for their son, and they came up short, so they decided to start Avocado Green Mattresses. Green mattresses and pillows made with natural and organic materials. I got one. I'm here sleeping on it. I'm sleeping better than ever during the... uh, Insane times, I climb up into my 100% natural latex bed with some Joma New Zealand wool to add in there, natural, certified organic cotton. This thing is the goods. I'm telling you, no petroleum-based foams, no chemical flame retardants, none of that stuff, handmade in sunny California, avocado green mattresses. Let me tell you what's going on. You get one of these things, and uh, you're going to sleep 100 times better right away. You got a 100-night sleep trial, 100 nights you can sleep in this thing, total test run. Free shipping, free return pickups. You got nothing to lose. 25-year warranty, rated five stars by verified customers. AvocadoGreenMattresses.com. Eco-friendly, sustainable materials made fresh, on-demand, recyclable, biodegradable. This thing is amazing. I also I love the pillows. You know how I had that messed up neck. These pillows are uh, clutch for me. They're coming in and just doing it right. I had some terrible pillows I bought at a place, and they said they wouldn't go flat, and these pillows went flat in like a month. Total jive. Anyway, avocadogreenmattresses.com. Get a mattress, 100-day free trial right now. Get on it. Tell them I sent you. You're going to love it. All natural. Great, great mattress. All right. Let me tell you something here. I realized as I was, uh, two things happened. Over the weekend, my old friend Craig Bearhorse posted up Uh, Four photos in his Instagram of a concert that I attended and he attended, not together, but in uh, Oakland, California. Of course, the mighty Dan the Greens that I have talked about and worshipped all my life. Um, On the 4th of July, back in the day, 40 years ago, to be exact, Sammy Hagar... Headlined the Oakland Coliseum. And that was uh, a mighty, mighty bill. I'll tell you who was on that bill right now. It was just insane. The year was 1980. Opening band. Let me see here. Is this it? This is it. Cruising on the Green was the name of the uh, Dan the Green. They called it that. Opener Randy Hansen. Then Triumph. Oreo Speedwagon. Blue Oyster Cult Sammy Hagar. Says here, originally the babies were scheduled to appear with Triumph and Randy Hansen replacing them. That's interesting. 
So, so cool. They only had two day on the greens in 1980. Before that, they would have about five to six a year, uh, a summer. Anyway, Sammy Hagar came out, absolutely destroyed the 60,000 people out there. And uh, this was not the first time I saw Sammy. I'd seen Sammy many times, including Fresno, Santa Rosa, Marin. I'd go all over to see this guy. And what he had at the time was just an insane live band. And you can go YouTube Sammy Hagar Winterland 1977 or Sammy Hagar Winterland 1978. And we are talking about a way different Sammy Hagar uh, that you might know. You might know him from... Uh, Van Halen, you might know him from the Cabo Wabo, you might know him from selling tequila, you might know him from the Circle, and you might know him, of course, from um, I Can't Drive 55. But in the late 70s, Sammy was a full blown rocker, and his band laid it out. One of my favorite records, of course was all night long, a live record he did. And, and coming out of Montrose, which was one of the great, great, great 70s records, this guy was uh, a, a, an insane singer and songwriter, and his band was Bulletproof. And the guitar player in that band was Gary Peel, a guy that I... Uh, I, I would watch every time he had amazing, tasty, tasty leads, as my buddy would say. And uh, so Craig posted these photos and talked about the gig. And there it was. I saw Gary Peel in one of the photos. I said, man, I've always wanted to talk to Gary Peel or uh, Bill Church or both of them and see what that what that whole thing was about. How did it happen? And uh, I just emailed Gary. He had a website. I emailed. I reached out on a Saturday. I said, I'd love to talk to you. He emailed right back and said, it'd be an honor to do it. I was like, floored. And uh, we got on the old Zoom yesterday and talked for about an hour and a half. And it was uh, an honor to have this man on my podcast. I feel that rock and roll is a lot like... Uh, a house where the architect gets all the glory, but you tend to forget about the guy that wired the house and the dude that did the plumbing and the guy that put the roof on it and uh, all that stuff. And that is what a lot of these bands have. They were part of the building process of these big, big people. Say Sammy Hagar, say a Bruce Springsteen. Um, any bands back then that had the front man, but you might not have known the uh, other people in the band, or you don't hear about them anymore, or any of that. But to me... You can always see one thing. It's somebody that's made it. It was the chemistry with the guys they uh, were playing with. Not all the time. Once in a while, you'll have just a, a complete lunatic that can do it all, like a prince. But like I said, man, it, it, it feels good to talk to these people that were the working cogs in the wheel. And to sit down and talk to Gary Peel was mind-boggling because here is a man who uh, has been playing rock and roll all his life. And, uh, you know, I don't know if, uh, how many people know who he is, but I love to spread the word on these type of people. He's been in Boston now, the band Boston, since 1986. And there is no bigger band 
than Boston when you think about the 70s. This band, the first Boston record, then Don't Look Back, and then the third one later on, Third Stage. These records are 70s rock. And he's been in that band ever since, and I've seen him in Boston also. So it is, a, uh, it is an honor to have him on, and I am fired up to share this interview with you guys. He is right up there uh, to me, as all my other Bay Area heroes like Dave Medichetti, Eric Martin, uh, the guys in Night Ranger, uh, Neil Schoen, uh, you know, Journey, uh, Huey Lewis, Grateful Dead, all these people, Metallica, just Bay Area gold. Before I do bring him on, I want to uh, give you a big heads up real quick. I've been doing the uh, Patreon Zoom Fest. If you uh, join the Patreon, you can hang out with me on Saturdays or Sunday nights where I have all the Patreon fans come on and we just shoot the shit and enjoy the evening. And it really, uh, it really helps give a little peace of mind. Uh, new Patreoners, Tom Longobardi, Mark Cooney, or Cunny, uh, Iman Connor, Chris Del Grande, David Broach, Greg Scott Dulberg, up in it, up in the game, Troy Igabrod, Pedro MS, Patrick Dominic Jr., Steve Hodgson upped his uh, ante, Matthias Matthias Kina, Darren Sherm, and China Ryder. There it is, the new Patreoners. This is episode 537. Thank you for joining me. Keep the candles lit. Here he is, Gary Peel. Here we are, another episode of Let There Be Talk. It is a fantastic guest today. Introduce yourself, my friend. Hey, my name is Gary Peel, spelled P-I-H-L. Of course, people change the H and the I, so it looks like Phil, but it's not that. It's P-I-H-L, like the chainsaw steel. So that's me. Anyway, I have uh, born in 1950, so I'm an old guy. I'll be turning 70 this year and still playing guitar. If you would have asked me when I was 16, would you still be playing guitar at 70? I would have said, no way. But here I am. It's, a, it's amazing, man. It's, there's nothing better than being able to be in the arts all your life, right? Although, <laughs> I wish I could say that's the only job I've had. But I've had lots of others over the years. Uh, uh, I worked in IT and web design and the photographer. Were you? Know, you- I, were you a bank teller in Petaluma for a minute? No, no, but I did live in Petaluma for some time, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Somebody told me that you were a bank teller at Petaluma, and I was like, I don't know, man, you know, because I grew up in the Bay Area. <laughs> huh? No, no, sorry, I didn't have that job. <laughs> let's, let's get into it a little bit. I am a huge fan of uh, your playing. I, I grew up watching you play. Uh, with Sammy Hagar, of course, uh, and then later on in Boston. And I didn't even know that you were in that band, Stark Raving Mad. Was that a Santa Rosa band? Yes. And uh, although I did perform with them, it was really just a um, kind of a fill-in gig for me. Uh, I was in a band in Petaluma called Crossfire. And the guys in Stark Raving Mad were about 10 years younger than me, actually. So they grew up watching us play in, in Crossfire. Uh, the, we had two keyboard players that were brothers, David Froome and Mitchell Froome. Oh, wow. Of course, Mitchell, Mitchell Froome has gone on to be a terrific producer. You know, Paul McCartney, Sheryl Crow. Of course. But, you know, the Pretenders, on and on and on and on. Uh, anyway, so they were fantastic musicians. Uh, I loved being in that band. Anyway, uh, uh, long story short there, the, the guys in Stark Raving Mad, uh, after Crossfire had broken up, uh, said, hey, we're putting together a band. We're looking for a singer. 
uh, do you know anybody? I said, no, I, I can't really recommend anybody. You know, there's plenty of guys out there. Go ahead and find somebody. But if you need somebody in the meantime, I'll sit in just as a singer. I wasn't even playing guitar at all because, you know, Paul Horowitz was his name. Of course, now he's Where? Paul T Taylor. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Was the guitarist. And so he was great. And so I said, hey, he's a great guitar player. He doesn't need me playing guitar. So, again, I just sat in with him just as a singer for a few gigs till they found Eric Martin. Yeah. who, of course, went on to be in Mr. Big. Yeah, and also 415 and the Eric Martin band. And, you know, right. I, I still think his record, Sucker for a Pretty Face, is one of the greatest Bay Area records to come out as far as some, you know, hit songwriting. And Eric is just a master uh, performer and singer. That, that guy can sing like a madman. Oh, yeah, he's great. He really is. Now, you grew up in San, uh, San Mateo, right? Well, uh, originally I'm from Chicago, but uh, moved to San Mateo when I was about 13 because uh, my parents were divorced and my mom moved out there. And I had a, the chance to either uh, join my mother in California or my dad who moved back to New Jersey. And I said, ah, give me California. Yeah. So yeah. I moved there. And uh, Chris went to high school and, uh, you know, was in bands in high school and that, that sort of thing. So, yeah, I, I kind of feel like I grew up in both places. Well, you know, go back to the Chicago area and I recognize the uh, street names and the towns, although I was too young to drive. So, you know, people said, oh, yeah, you're a Chicago blues guy. And I said, well, I wasn't hanging out at the clubs when I was 10, you know. Right, right. What, uh, now, at 13... Um, what year is that for you? It's uh, yeah, so 63 again, I was born in 1950. So 63. Uh, in, uh, so when I was a freshman, I uh, found a couple of the guys in Hillsdale high school there in San Mateo. And one of the guys said, Hey, there's a, a guy giving lessons in a couple towns over. You may remember Palo Alto and those, those towns. Yeah. There's a guy giving lessons over there and he's really good. We should all take lessons from him. And I said, okay, great. So we went down there to take lessons. And this guy was great because he was older than us and was giving lessons in a music store. And uh, he taught us some cool stuff. And uh, we went to go see his band play. They were called the Warlocks. We, oh, saw, yeah. him play, we saw him play at, at Magoo's Pizza Parlor in Palo Alto. And uh, then a few, months a few months later, they changed their name to the Grateful Dead. And that was Jerry <laughs> giving us lessons. Wow, man, that is incredible. Yeah, so lucky just being in the right place at the right time. So at your age, it's got to be the Beatles, right, that hits you? Sure. So, in fact, uh, people that are younger than me, they say, well, the Beatles, I mean, you know, I love the Beatles, they're cool. I said, but when you're that age, so when they came out in 63, you know, I was 13, 12, 13, and they were singing, I want to hold your hand. Yeah. But then when, by the time I got to 16, they're singing, why don't we do it in the road? Yeah. So for a 16-year-old guy, yeah, that's right. Yeah, I love these guys. You know? yeah. So that's, that's the difference. Like their maturity completely matched mine uh, along the way. And of course, then they got in the whole, you know, give peace a chance and the Vietnam War and all that, which, again, if you're 10 years later than that, you didn't go through all that stuff and, and not quite the same way. Were you, um, once you start to get to a certain age, were you hanging out in that uh, Bill Graham scene of the Fillmore and seeing all those cool psychedelic shows at the Fillmore and stuff? Yes. Uh, uh, again, when I was in high school, I had a, a great friend in our band who was uh, a, a year ahead of me so he could drive. Right. <laughs> and he had his license, you know. And he would go to see bands and, and sometimes he would take us along. But uh, he came. So at that point, we were into you know, like white soul music because we were white guys, you know, but we love listening to the soul stations, you know, KSOL and, uh, yeah. uh, and uh, oh, oh, what's the other one? She, KDIA. Uh, that's it. Yeah. KDIA. Yeah. And of course, you know, Sly Stone was a DJ yeah. and was, was a KSOL or whatever. Anyway, yeah. so we love that soul music and that's what we were playing. Uh, we were in, you know, cover band playing that, you know, playing those kind of songs. And so the uh, young rascals came to town to play at film or something. And, and uh, again, our, our buddy Keith went down to see him and he came back and said, oh man, the rascals, they were so cool. But the band opening for them was way cool. We got to watch these guys. They're called The Doors. Oh. So, er, you know, change, change, you know, take a left turn here. And so we got into the whole, you know, San Francisco psychedelia kind of sound. And yeah, yeah our life changed from that day forward. 
That, that, that music scene is absolutely insane. When you think about us growing up in the Bay Area, what Bill Graham created, that, that melting pot of different styles and putting those shows together, really taught uh, myself and probably you, everybody, uh, about all different types of music. It wasn't just about one thing, you know? Yes, there was such a diversity of bands from the Bay Area. Like, nobody sounded alike. It wasn't like, oh, well, this is a, a San Francisco sound to us. And everybody was different, you know. Santana, they didn't sound like the Dead or the Airplane or, or anybody else that came along after that, Huey Lewis or, you know, anybody. Yeah. So it was Janice, different. Quicksilver, I mean. I, right. If you, if you look at the Bay Area, it's insane – that it, I still feel the Bay Area is really underrated. If you look at it, like, I mean, Huey Lewis Sports is one of the biggest records selling of all time. Uh, and then you've got all of the hippie stuff, uh, you know, Janice, Grateful Dead. And all. Then you get into Metallica and all that. It's just the amount of art that has come out of that area is mind boggling. Yeah, I was very lucky to be, uh, again, in the right place at the right time to, to see a lot of that. Yeah. Uh, when I was uh, about 20, I was in a band, a three-piece band, me on guitar, Johnny Vernazza, Johnny V, who actually went on to play with Elvin Bishop and Roy Garcia. Anyway, we had a three-piece band. We did the audition at Bill Graham's Fillmore because those were the days, you know, like Monday was audition day. Wow. You take, your, take your band, go down there, audition. Well, Bill liked us. He put us on a show with three, of course, with Paul Rogers and Blood Rock. So we were the third band on that show, yeah. uh, which was January. I just looked it up. It was January 71. And, and that, that was a, a great thing. You know, we we're just an unknown band, just local guys from San Francisco. Well, I, you know, I know the Bay Area inside and out, the music scene, and I didn't know there was an audition night on Monday. So run me through that. Would there be an audience there or would Bill just be out in the, in the venue watching you? How'd that work? Yeah, there was an audience. And of course, uh, it was too long ago. I can't remember now if there was any admission charge or not. If there was, it was minimal. Of course, it didn't cost much to get in anyway, you know, like 350 or something, you know, but yeah. whatever. I, I don't know if it's free or not, but yeah, audition. Anybody could come. In fact, I, you know, well, I digress here, but uh, here's another story. Uh, I was just reading uh, Bruce Springsteen's biography, autobiography, and he talked about how uh, he had come out to California and because, of course, he was from New Jersey, right? Yeah, he drove out there. Yeah, so he came out and he auditioned at Graham's, you know, Fillmore. They didn't get the gig. <laughs> and he said, man, I thought I was a great guitar player, but I got out there, I was like, wow, there are a lot of other guys that are playing for the gig. Yeah, yeah, so the, yeah. so the, the funny thing to me was, so I, again, I'm in high school and, I, and my mom said, oh, gee, I work with the, another woman uh, who has a son who plays guitar. And I said, yeah, 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 everybody plays guitar, you know. She goes, oh, yeah, her name is Adele and, and they're from New Jersey. And so... Uh, you know, some years later, she said, well, did, gee, didn't Adele's son do well? I said, Adele, oh, yeah, the woman you worked with at the shopping center. And she goes, yeah, that, Adele Springsteen. So <laughs> my mom worked with Bruce's mom at that wow. time when we were teenagers. Yeah, yeah. Bruce's mom was out there in uh, San Mateo and uh, Stanford area there. Exactly. Yeah. So my mom and her mom worked. They were secretaries at the Hillsdale Shopping Ball uh, there in San Mateo. What a great story, dude. Well, I'm telling this to my dad, you know, again, years later. And uh, I said, you never guess, you know, mom used to work with Bruce's mom. And my dad says, well, gee, I worked with Jay Guile's father. <laughs> what are the odds of that? You know? That is nuts, dude. <laughs> yeah. Uh, of course, in New Jersey, right? Because that's yeah. where he lived. Yeah. Wow. That's so weird, man. And especially since Bruce is from Jersey, you'd think that his mom would be out there. But it was, yeah, she moved. The other way around. Yeah. Crazy. Let, okay, let's get into it a little bit. I first get way heavy into Sammy Hagar in the uh, sev you know that seventies era of Hagar. I come yeah. in, I come in, of course, on the live record uh, all night long, which is an absolute uh, smoker of a record, and that's that era where all the groups had to kind of have a live record to get noticed. Peter Frampton kind of kicked that off. Oh yeah. Um, how do you uh, get? into the Sam Hagar band because I know on the first record he had a different guitar player what happens there how does this happen I tell this story to young guitar players particularly because uh, 
it's a, a history of uh, being humble. So here it is. So Sammy, uh, again, was in Montrose. Right. Uh, and uh, actually, Ronnie kicked him out of the band. Yep. Uh, so Sammy started his own band and brought along Bill Church, their bassist, you know, the from best. that. The electric yeah. church. Yeah. So, uh, again, I was in uh, bands uh, right there in the Bay Area, and we heard that Sammy had left Montrose. And so our manager called him up and said, hey, we're looking for a singer. You know, would you join our band? This was Crossfire with the Froom Brothers and all that. And we thought we were pretty good. He says, well, thanks. You know, I, I've, I'm putting a band together now, but I actually need to do some gigs. And can I open up for you guys? And we said, okay, sure. So we had some club dates and Sammy came and opened for us. And he was just three piece at the time, just he and Bill and Billy Carmasi on drums. Of course, it was wow. Denny. Right. Denny was played in Montrose. And of course, Denny went on to play with Hart. Uh, but anyway, uh, so we got to know Sammy a little bit and kept in touch. And uh, our band had been together about four years and, and never, you know, just never quite made it. And so uh, our manager said, why don't you try out for Sammy's band? And I said, well, I don't know. He's been through about like a half a dozen guitar players and, and I'm not sure. So uh, anyway, I, I called him up and, and he said, hey, P.F. Uh, are you into drugs? I said, well, no. Why? He said, well, because my last guitar player OD'd on cocaine in the bathroom of a gas station. I said, oh, man. So she said, well, so why don't you come down and jam with us? So I go down to their rehearsal and, and jam with them. Where and was well, the rehearsal? San Rafael or something? Uh, it was in San Francisco, SIR. Okay. Oh, SIR there, back in the yeah. old days. Yeah. Anyway, so while I'm there auditioning, jamming, whatever you want to call it, you know, Sammy's manager calls up and says, hey, there was a gig with Queen and Thin Lizzy, Queen canceled. Thin Lizzy's going to headline. You guys could be the opening act if you have a guitar player. So, of course, Sammy turns to me and says, hey, can you do the gig? It's in two days. And, of course, I said, yeah, sure. Yeah, let's go for it. <laughs> so, you know, two days later, I'm on stage with Sammy. And we, do, you know, did the show. And uh, actually, we got a nice write-up in the local paper about it. But I thought that was it. I thought that, you know, I was just filling in, right? So I'm saying goodbye to the guys. We actually did two shows. So after the end of the second show, I'm saying goodbye to, to Bill. And he goes, no, 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 no. You're in the band. I said, oh, nobody really told me. Wow. I thought I was just filling in. Wow. Now let's, <laughs> let's talk about uh, Ben Lizzie. Was it at Winterland or where was this? Uh, there were two shows, one in Sacramento Civic Center and the other in San Jose Civic Center, I believe. Wow. Did you, did you talk to those guys at all? What era is that? that that's uh, 77. Class? Whoa. Man. Yeah, with, of course, Phil Lynott and all the guys, yeah, you know. Yeah, 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 Scott Gorman and all the, oh, my, man. Yeah. Now, uh, what were those shows like? Well, you know, fantastic. You know, I, I loved Thin Lizzy's sound. They were just terrific, you know. And But for me, it's like I'm still, you know, practicing in the back room before we go on, yeah. <laughs> trying to remember all the songs, you know. What were you guys playing? Just mostly mantra stuff and some new Sammy songs? Yes, Sammy had written two albums by that point. Wow. And so, uh, of his own, I should say, you know. And so, uh, yeah, we did some Montrose stuff, you know, uh, of course, Rock Candy and um, Bad Motor Scooter. Uh, but then some songs off of uh, his first two solo albums. Right, yeah, uh, Nine on a Ten Scale. Right. And, and then the, yeah, and then the other one. Gotcha. The Red Album, which yeah. didn't really have a name, it was just Sammy Hager, but it, they called it the Red Album because it was all painted red. Oh, yeah. And so that, that's that song "Red" was on there. We we did that one certainly. So that basically is kind of the uh, set that would be created for the live record, right? Uh, that didn't come too much later than that, right? Seventy. Uh, yeah, uh, we actually went to England to record the third Sammy's third album, which I was on, and uh, "Musical Chairs." Oh, that's right. Yeah, sorry. Yep. Uh, so that was the first album I was on. Uh, with again, Alan Fitzgerald was playing keyboards with Fitz, us. Yeah, right. And so people say, "Wait, he was keep, he was a bassist for Montreal. I said, "Well, yeah, but <laughs> so uh, what? You have two bass players, you know, Alan Fitzgerald and Bill Church. No, 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 no. Fitz is playing keys and uh, Alan Fitzgerald. And actually, when I joined, Chuck Ruff was the drummer. Right from uh, Edgar Winter. Exactly. But uh, he left, and we. Got Denny Carmasi in the band for us uh, with us for uh, the musical chairs album. So basically, it was all Montrose except me, right? You know, wow. Sandy, Bill, Fitz, Denny, and me. You know, wow! Uh, I never thought and, of that. Yeah. So 
uh, one of the, also one of the first gigs we did, uh, actually when Chuck was with us even, was uh, Sammy's manager knew the manager from Boston. Right. And uh, so he got us on the last couple of weeks of the first Boston tour as the opening act. So they liked us, we liked them, and, and they said, gee, why don't you guys open up our entire second tour? So from 78 into 79, we were on the road, you know, nine months straight uh, all across the U.S. as opening band for Boston. So I've been on every Boston tour, but the first two of them, I was in the opening act. That's, that's insane. And, and you're on Boston, too. Uh, don't look back. So you played that Dan the Green, that classic giant Dan the Green. Of course, Sammy headlines later, but it's funny to think about how big Sammy gets from 78, don't look back, to a couple years later, which was the anniversary yesterday, 40 year, uh, where Sammy's headlined it on Danger Zone, you know? Yeah, sure. You know, uh, again, uh, your listeners probably don't remember the old days of AM radio, but AM was still the king in the early to mid 70s. And so so here we are in Sammy's band. He was in Montrose. And here we are, you know, you know, second bill, a day in the green. In fact, I think even when we headlined, uh, that was still just I'm trying to think what year that was anyway. But the point of it was. The big AM station, which was exactly, they would not play Sammy Hager songs. And, you know, again, we we played our own shows, you know, the Cow Palace and this and that headliners. You know, we didn't headline the Day in the Green yet, but still, we were playing 10,000 seaters and KFC would not play Sammy Hager songs. Well, you know, that's our format, blah, 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 blah. You know, so, but the, again, those were the days that AM was the big thing. Like FM radio was still underground coming up. But if you didn't have a record on AM, you know, you were just not nationally known. Wow. So, but of course, as you say, that changed almost overnight. Like all of a sudden, FM was the thing. AM got relegated to sports and talk radio. Right. And nobody listened to AM for music anymore. But again, when I was growing up and right until that point, of the early Sammy Hager days, AM was the king. Wow. Now, now, was there a reason why they put it? Was it just too rocking or what was going on? Because I don't remember KFRC playing anything at all uh, kind of rock. They'd play some, you know, you know stuff like uh, Disco Duck, you know, weird, yeah. weird, weird stuff. Uh, but once FM hits... That's when, you know, KOME, KSJO, all those stations, that's when I start to hear Ted Nugent, Blue Oyster Colt, all that, all that set Boston, Eagles, all that stuff. I never really remembered hearing that on KFRC at all. And I listened to that every day on the way to school. Yeah, Uh, you're right. Uh, Again, those were the days where Top 40 was the entire Top 40. So you'd hear, uh, you know, some, the Beatles, of course. Yeah. and maybe some stones, but you'd also hear Frank Sinatra and Patty Page and, you know, people like that. Like it was everybody. And of course, soul bands, you know, whoever was uh, hip at the time, uh, you know, the Supremes or the Four Tops or things like that. So they played everything because that top 40 was, again, the entire top 40. Right. Now, was Sammy, when you joined the band, I mean, that, of course, Montrose record is so damn iconic. It's a masterpiece. When he uh, jo- when you joined the band, is he got a good core following already from the Montrose record? Because uh, I grew up on that record later on in late seventies, and of course, everyone rocked this record. But was it big when it came out? Because I don't remember. Unfortunately, Montrose wasn't real big nationally. There were. You know, of, again, uh, some areas that were hot for him, certainly the Bay Area. Again, we played a lot and again, big places. But when we were on the Boston tour in 78 through 79, uh, we would go back east or down south. And people said, Sam Hager, uh, is he one of the Hager twins from Hee Haw? <laughs> so, oh, no, no, no. He's from Montrose. And so, yeah, people did not know us at all east of the Mississippi. Now, for some reason, St. Louis jumped on it. Yeah. And 
Uh, and when we went there, we said, wow, why is it so big? He said, because well, we're getting play on AM radio in wow. St. Louis. Wow. So we headlined the Checker Dome. We, we filmed our live uh, MTV concert there in St. Louis because we were huge in St. Louis. And, uh, you know, if we would have known, you know, what's the secret of being big in St. Louis, we would have taken that everywhere. But that's that's just the way it was. So well, St. Uh, yeah, Louis we were, is a rock town, man. Oh, yeah. You know, come on. Uh, uh, I think, what was their station there? Was it The Loop? One of those uh, places had a huge, uh, St. Louis had a huge uh, rock station there that was just well known, you know? Uh, yeah, The Loop, of course, was Chicago. Okay, yeah, they, St. Oh. St. Louis had some station. I just remember, yeah. you know, they were kind of like yeah. tastemakers out there, you know? Yeah, yeah, so it was a great town for us. But that's the way it was, just, you know, different pockets of uh, support here and there. We would we would go to Texas and do 12 shows because we were big in Texas. You know? Yeah, yep, ZZ Top style, you know? Yeah. Those guys are just, a lot of bands, you know, uh, if you look at Ozzy on that Blizzard of Oz, he did a full Texas tour, like 20 dates, because there's so many small <laughs> spots, you know? Exactly. Yeah, we had Corpus Christi, Amarillo, you know, Lubbock. Yeah. You know, we, we played all those places. Now, when this live record gets recorded, where do you guys do that? And is it actually live or is it one of those classic 70s, Kiss, or you know, any of those where it's just stuff overdubbed? San Antonio, Texas. Wow. <laughs> wow. Uh, a, a great place. Uh, again, for, you know, uh, Texas was great for us. Uh, we, we love playing there. So uh, that's you know, we recorded a few shows and that was the one, you know? So good. Now, was there dubs or, or is it pretty, pretty real? That was for real. Wow. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Now there was one song that we hadn't written up to that point, which was called I've done everything for you. Of course, the big hit. Which, yeah. Which of course, um, what's his name? Rick Springfield covered. Yep. Uh, that we hadn't, you know, Sammy hadn't written that one yet and we needed one more song for the album. So we went into a studio in San Francisco and just played it live. Just, there you go, record it, take two, done, you know. And threw so, some audience on it? Yeah, yeah, Love just the uh, other it. audience tracks. So that, that was the one song that wasn't played in front of people. But again, we definitely played it straight through. In fact, that was really the way that we recorded, you know. Um, our last album, my last album with Sammy was VOA with I Can't Drive 55 on it. And yeah, that took us 12 days to record everything, overdubs, everything. Because with the band played live in the studio, of course, Sammy sang along as a scratch track, so we knew where we were in the song. But that was it. You know, everybody just played their parts, ta-da. And then Sammy went, Sammy and I went back in and recorded our solos. And then we did vocals. And so again, 12 days it was done. You know, so when I joined Boston, uh, you know, Tom, you know, his third album took Six, Six years. years to make. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Not the same. No. Now, when you first joined Sammy, let's get into a couple things on here that I always uh, loved about you. But uh, when you first joined, does he, how do you delegate the leads uh, uh, between the two of you? And, um, you know, like what gear were you using? Did you come in? It's like, cause I know you use that great SG junior that later had uh, humbuckers in it, kind of KK or a Glenn Tipton from pre style. But um, when you came in to find your sound, how did that all come about? Were you like, okay, I'm going to be a humbucker guy. I play solos here and there. How was that delegated out? Uh, really? It was just, uh, Sammy's whim at the moment, you know, I was like, okay, yeah, you play the solo here. I'm going to do this one. Let's do a duel. And, and sometimes we would do a trade-off. And usually when we did a trade-off, we were both standing there in the room together, play, go, you go, you know, and then just doing it back and forth done, you know? So, cause uh, again, we had played so many shows over the years uh, and as you know, Sammy is so spontaneous on stage. You're like, hey, go, you know, play the solo. I'm going to run over here and do something, you know. So we were just up for anything. So uh, it, it was very comfortable for us to just just play. Wow, man. that's just, and, and were you always a humbucker guy or did you ever have your Strat error or what was going on? Uh, for a while in actually in Crossfire, but also when I was in Sammy's band, I played a P90. It was a, a Les Paul double cutaway. Uh, I didn't play it for a whole lot, long time because stage lights back in the day would make 
P90 pickups hum like crazy. Right. So I had to switch to humbuckers. But uh, I love the guitar. But, you know, you, you get on a stage, you know, so it yeah. was unusable sometimes. You know, I had to, you know, switch to humbuckers. But, yeah, I'd played uh, SGs since like 1969 or something. Yeah. And, and why was that? Were you into a certain player that was playing them, like a Frank Marino or something or, or you know? Uh, well, you mentioned Quicksilver. And yeah, John Cipollina from Quicksilver had an SG. And, uh, so I, you know, I thought he was a terrific player. And so, yeah, I, I saw that. So that's what I want. And for me, I like a double cutaway guitar as right. opposed to a Les Paul because I like to get my thumb around on the other side. So right. I've always been a double cutaway kind of guy. Yeah, yeah. And what, what was the history of that, um, that, that obviously a P90 SG, kind of like uh, if you're looking at it like a Robbie Krieger, what was the history of that? Did you put the humbuckers in or did you buy it like that? Well, there were uh, a couple of SGs that I had. One was, uh, yeah, like a 64 uh, SG that had, yeah, special. I'm trying to remember the names now. Yeah, the standard had humbuckers, the special had P90s. And the junior had just one right. P90. Right. I did have a junior uh, for a while that I used, but uh, it was the special, the 64 special that had two P90s that belonged to a buddy of mine uh, back again, my high school days. And I bought the guitar from him uh, and he had actually changed it out because he was having trouble with, you know, stage lights as well. So he had actually changed out to humbuckers and he came to me one day and said, Hey, I found this guitar uh, pickup company called Overland. Uh, they're from Santa Rosa. He said, they make great pickups. They're active pickups. So you need a battery with it, which were, that was unusual at the time. Well, of course, Overland changed their name to EMG. EMG. Yeah. Yeah, wow. yeah. I never knew they were Overland before that. Yeah. Not Overland, but Overland, L-E-N-D. Oh, so, wow. Yeah. So uh, again, so he was uh, way ahead of his time on that one. And so I, I used... Um, uh, humbuckers for a while. And then, you know, again, my buddy turned me on to EMG and I use those for many, many years. Wow. And then uh, I know that during the Sam era, you were always uh, advertised as a Randall user. Were you a Randall user at the beginning or Marshall or what's going on there? Uh, you know, I had a Marshall back in the day in the sixties and all that. When I joined Sammy's band, he had a couple of music man amps that he wanted us to use. I said, okay, sure, I, I can do that. And we used to put them on the side of the stage, facing in at us from the side, so that we could run around, particularly Sammy, and yeah. still hear it. Because you know how it is, if you stand in front of your guitar amp, it's great. But if you move to left or right, you know, five, 10 feet, you can't hear it anymore. But if it's on the side, it blows across the whole stage. Wow. And so that was our, our idea of, you know, making sure you can hear yourself. So that's what we did. So we had Music Man amps that actually I had a friend of mine modify to, to get them a little hotter. And then one day, uh, one of the Randall reps uh, saw our show and said, hey, well, you should try out Randall. I said, okay. So he had a music store and I went and tried and said, wow, this is not what I'm looking for. You know, it's pretty clean. They were into country at the time. He said, well, next time you're in LA, go down to the Randall factory. And of course, Don Randall used to work for Fender. And so I went down to the factory there and Gary Sunda was the engineer there. And I said, you know, I'm, I, you know, I'm a rock guy. I want some more distortion. He goes, well, we're, we've just come up with this new amp, but it's not even out yet. It's called the switch master, two channels, one clean, but one distorted. I plugged into that. So, oh yeah, there you go. That's it. So I, I took that immediately with me on the road, the whole Boston tour. That's what I used. Never broke down. I only had the one, you know, yeah. I had the old music man as a spare, but you know, it, it was terrific. And so I, I used those uh, just, just about the rest of the, uh, my time with Sammy. When you um, play that Boston day on the green with Sammy over, is that at the time the biggest gig you yourself had ever played? I mean, that's 65,000 people in the A's uh, stadium. That was certainly one of the biggest. Although again, back when I was in Fox with again, Johnny V and Roy, uh, we did a couple of festivals, uh, one in Portland, outside of Portland at the state, um, you know, uh, park there that the governor put on. And I don't know why they did it, but whatever. It was a big rock festival. Those were the days, right? So this was like 1970. And uh, so there were 50,000 people there. Wow. Uh, 
And it just so, and again, it was this big deal, this state park, the government, you know, the government was, you know, footing the bill or whatever. And uh, there was a, a camera crew on stage while we were playing and we were on in the afternoon or something. And uh, so, you know, again, it was kind of a big deal at the time. Because later that night, I called up my dad again in New Jersey. Hey, dad, you never, I played this huge place, the biggest show I ever played, you know, 50,000 people. And he says, yeah, I know. I just saw it on the news. Wow. Wow. That's <laughs> so cool. What, what are the odds of that, that your dad would see you on the news that night, you know? Oh, man. I tell you, man, uh, some of those, Sam, I've, I've seen Sammy on every tour uh, uh, since, I think, 78. And some of those tours were mind-boggling. The one that really uh, I remember was Sammy had this idea to do a small California tour called Taking It to the People. Yes. You remember this? Absolutely. We had Night Ranger open up for us. Absolutely. And that was, I think that was a genius idea to really kind of just tour California in these smaller venues and really spread the word around to all the like teenagers, you know? Yeah. And, uh, gosh, uh, it, that was always a lot of fun to play smaller places actually, because the sound was usually better, you know, outdoors at Oakland Coliseum. Yeah, it's great that you got 60,000 people out there, but I mean, I don't know what it sounded like for the guy in the last row, you know? Yeah. 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 One of my favorite Sammy shows was uh, when you guys headlined, which is 40 years ago yesterday. It, I mean, it's, it, it was such a, a, a wild thing, man. He came out of the side scrim uh, that was a Trans Am, and you guys just crushed it that day, man. I uh, mean, crushed it. Well, thanks. Yeah, I, I had uh, eight great years with Sammy, and he was always, you know, like uh, – the, the most positive guy you'd ever want to be in a band with, you know, he was always in a good mood and he was always the cheerleader. You know, like next year is going to be even better. And it was every year I was in the band, we played bigger and bigger places. We sold more records, you know, and it just went up and up and up. And of course, you know, when he came to us there and said, Oh, I, I you know, I hate to say this, but I got, I got an offer. I can't refuse, you know, Van Halen asked me to join the band and I hate to lose you guys, but you know, what can I do? And, so we were, of course, disappointed, but, you know, hey, you know, it's, it's our buddy, you know, we want to see him do the best. So, but at that time, uh, Tom Scholes from Boston heard that Sammy was leaving and called me up and said, uh, gee, I heard you're out of a gig. Would you come and play on the uh, third stage album? Uh, I've got one more song that needs to be recorded. Would you come out here and play on it? Of course, I said, oh, absolutely. So I left from our last gig with Sammy, which was Farm Aid One in Champaign, Illinois, Flew, yeah. direct, flew directly from there to Boston to start working with Tom. And then after I'd been there a few weeks, Tom said, gee, I think we work well together. And of course, I'd known him because we'd been on tour with him, you know. Right. And he said, why don't you move back here? We'll finish this album and we'll see if we can do some touring. Who knows? It, you know, because it'd been six years, right? So, yeah. you know, if anybody cares or not, and uh, we'll, we'll take it from there. And so, uh, yeah, I wasn't out of work for a day. I mean, how lucky could a guy get? God, that's crazy because you got to think about Bill Church, who I think lives out in Fresno now. His son hits me up quite a bit. Um, that's got to be weird because let's get into that dynamic a little bit. Now, Sammy had these core guys, you and Bill Church, of course, and went through different drummers. You had uh, with that uh, Lowry guy on the later era. And yes. Harmosky so for, yeah. and Ruff. Right. Yeah. First, well, when I joined, again, it was Chuck Ruff. But again, before that, Billy Carmasi, then Chuck Ruff, then Denny Carmasi, then Chuck came back, then Dave Lauser, yeah. uh, of course, who went on to play with him and, and uh, still does play with him with the Wabaritos. Wow. Now, when that happens, were the entire history of the band, are you guys just paid guys? Uh, because you weren't doing any songwriting, right? Every once in a while, Sammy would split a song four ways because we would all make contributions to all the songs, really, as as you know, he would come up with the ideas, but you know, you're a guitar player. You put in the part that you think fits or whatever. And, and he always gave us, you know, freedom to do that kind of stuff. So every once in a while he would take a song and split it four ways or five, whatever was in the band at the time. Well, that's, that's gotta be, uh, 
you know, I mean, it's, it's spooky because basically you guys were kind of hired guns the entire run, but you were, in my eyes, the band. You were Sammy's band. I, I couldn't imagine ever not seeing Gary or, or Bill Church over there. You know, those, the live dynamics that you guys had, that was a band. I know it was Sammy's name, but I always knew you were a band. I knew the players' names, you know, so that had to be spooky. Were you just paid a salary or how did that go? Uh, we were paid uh, a salary and got bonuses when we do bigger shows or the tour would do well, that sort of thing. And again, as I said, it got better every single year. So uh, we didn't complain uh, as far as that went. But uh, right when I joined the band, Sammy had said, now look, it, it's my band. I'm going to write the songs. That's the way it is. It's going to be, you know. Right. Uh, but he was obviously very loyal to us and and it was the other guys, the other drummers that kind of left along the way. Like Denny Carmasi left to join St. Paradise. Wow. That was yeah. Derek St. Holmes. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, that didn't work out, but then he joined Hart, you know, so he, he worked out okay, you know. Wow, well, yeah, uh, well, I mean, fantastic drummer, you know. Yeah, but yeah, Sammy was very loyal to us because, I mean, you know, as a guitar player, how many other terrific guitar players are there out there, you know, guys that are just, you know, can play circles around me. Yeah. But Sammy, you know, kept me in the band, you know, and uh, I, I thought we did well. And here's an example. Uh, I mentioned Night Ranger. Uh, when I, you know, I, again, I had tried out for Sammy's band, but so did Jeff Watson, who, of course, went on to play with Night Ranger. Right. Right. And Jeff, you know, he's the eight finger guy. Yeah. You know, he's just fantastic. He's a great keyboard player, too. Anyway, so he had tried out before me and Sammy said, well, Watson, you know, is a great player, but it's like, on your marker set, go. And he just plays as many notes as he can. And he said, you know, he's not really playing the song. He's, he's playing his parts, you know. So right. I, I hope, that, again, I tell this to younger musicians. I said, you know, yeah, you want to do the best you can, but do the best for the song, you know, whatever the song requires. Well, I always say, who gives a fuck about a solo? If there's no song, you're never going to hear the solo. So you got to have a great song. You yeah. Know? What yeah. were you? Who were your guys when you, of course, we talked to Beatles, but, and, and, and Cipollina and stuff, but who were your guys where you started to understand this type of playing, like play the best you can for the song? Who were they? Oh, you know, everybody really at the time, uh, you mentioned the Eagles. I mean, you know, how great are their songs, you know, and they're great players, but they don't come off like, virtuosos like hey, hey let me take this solo for three days no i mean they're, they're so tasty and melodic you know so that's those are the kind of players that i really enjoyed listening to yeah uh, again certainly hendrix i mean i saw jimmy play you know and uh, back in the day Where at? so uh at the avalon ballroom san francisco wow, wow. so uh yeah it it was great to again grow up and see those those people play you know no, well, I mean, you know, you, your playing, I always felt was just, it wasn't like you were this lead guy in Sammy's band. You guys just intertwined a lot and, and the guitars just went in and out of this great songs, you know. But of course, later, um, and I think once the Geffen records, uh, the Geffen years come around of Standing Hampton and uh, Three Lock Box and VOA, you're going to get into this keyboard era. Now, was that a label decision or Sammy? What, what is that? Because now the guitars are kind of sitting in the back of the tune and it's more kind of a radio friendly songs. Right. Uh, again, when I joined the band, Alan Fitzgerald Fitz was the keyboard player. And, but it was, you know, really a guitar band. A lot of people said, Oh man, I didn't even know you had a keyboard. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He, he, you know, played rhythm with us. He didn't do a lot of solos. There was some, you know, some far out stuff he would do. And he was certainly a great player, no question yeah. about it. Yeah. But a lot of songs did not feature the keys. You know, a few of them did. And of course, he did a great job. Uh, along the way, uh, again, we were in the middle of the Boston tour because it was so long, right? That uh, Fitz got the call from Ronnie Montrose to come back and play bass in Gamma. The band he was putting yeah. together. Yeah, and so, the best. Yeah. So Fitz left our band uh, and went back to join Ronnie. So we just continued on as a four-piece with no keyboard player. 
But uh, again, when we started doing records for Geffen, we had a couple of guys sit in. Uh, Alan Pasqua played keys, I know, on a track, and uh, some other guys I can't even remember now. But would session guys would come in and play parts here and there. And uh, so, uh, in fact, I even played keys on some songs uh, before we got a keyboard player. Uh, to, uh, can't, uh, can't remember the, all the songs now, but there are about like, two or three songs that I just played keys on. Wow. So Sammy played guitar because th- it was on the record, you know. But finally said, well, gee, why don't we hire a real keyboard player? Yeah. And so you could just play guitar. I said, great. So we found Jesse Harms, who had played with uh, 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 John Hyatt and Buffy St. Marie and some other people. So he, uh, and a terrific singer. So uh, we, we hired him and uh, he was a great addition to the band. I think what's really amazing, first of all, Sammy was churning out some songs, man, these records. Although the records, when you look, they're only eight song records. It's so funny to think about. But when we get to Standing Hampton, his uh, songwriting completely went to another level. You know, it was like, wow. I mean, I, were you blown away when he was bringing in these songs? I got to say, yes, uh, they were, again, more pop friendly, not as straight ahead, you know, heavy metal or whatever you want to call it, you know, right. from the old days. So, yeah, he, he definitely evolved as a songwriter over the years. Especially like I'll Fall in Love Again, you know, uh, that kind of flavor. Of course, he's got the song Heavy Metal on there from the movie soundtrack. Right. And, and you guys also did Fast Times at Ridgemont High, which is a crushing soundtrack song too but that other stuff i mean if you look at it like babies on fire uh there's only one way to rock total radio you know yeah. song uh that stuff was completely different from uh danger zone danger zone was almost feels a little bit experimental to me at, at times you know it's funny you say that but yes uh, uh, it definitely was that was uh <laughs> we just tried all kinds of things uh, on that one. Uh, and Sammy had always had a love of space and aliens and all that kind of stuff. And so uh, he definitely let some of that out, you know, like, of course, way back in Montrose, he had space station number five and yeah, some of yeah. the stuff. So he, I, he always had that in the back of his mind that he wanted to, to see a bigger picture. And that's actually when I joined the band, I had, of course, heard Bad Motor Scooter and some of those on the radio. And I figured, well, you know, he's just kind of a three chord rock kind of guy. But after I got to talk to him and he was, you know, telling me about all kinds of things and where he wanted to go musically, I said, wow, this guy is going to go somewhere. I want to I want to be a part of that. Oh, I'll tell you what. My favorite Sammy song is In the Room, which is on Three Lock Box. It oh, yeah. is such a bizarre, weird tune. It's, it's kind of like, what is this? You know, that, and also that song, actually Danger Zone, just the closing acoustic bizarre tune, you know? So he, yeah. does, he does have some bizarre flavors. And uh, that's what I loved about it. It wasn't always just this uh, kind of standard three chord rock. And I'll tell you, your guys' live shows, I don't know if you guys were, you just constantly feeling kind of competitive with people like Skinner and stuff, but your live show was next level, man. If you watch some of that early Winterland stuff, the black and white Winterland concerts on YouTube. And then of course those Dan, the greens, they were just punches in the face, complete, complete smoke and rock concerts, you know? Well, thanks. Yeah. Again, we get on stage and, probably played a little too fast on some of the songs, you know, ah. but we were just amped up, ready to go, ready to yeah. you know, play. And, and Sammy, I mean, gosh, if you've been to those shows, you know, he'd climb up the scaffolding oh, and man. all kinds of dangerous stuff, which, Oh, I hope he's going to, you're not going to fall down, yeah. but uh, he would just do anything to put on a show. And that's just the way he was. And of course the, the audience just loved it, you know? And oh, yeah. again, as opening act, again, when we were on opening act for Boston or ZZ top or whoever it was, you know, that uh, we, you know, we'd come out just blazing, you know, fast rock stuff. And then we, in the middle of the set, we'd always do a slow song. A lot of times it was the old Donovan song. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. Well, he and where, that. Yeah. And that's, that's on the uh, live album there. And, uh, the Sammy did a long solo in the middle and it was different every single night. 
you know, because he's a singer, right? So he just yeah. thinking of melodies in his head and luckily he could play them, you know, and every night it was different, but that really got the audience because this wasn't like, da -da 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 -da, you know, for 40 minutes, you know, yeah. uh, it really showed off his voice and his, you know, uh, just who he was really well and then play a great solo over it. And yeah, yeah. The audience just loved that stuff. What do you think the, um, the who was behind the machine of you guys because like you said you guys were getting bigger and bigger each year who was believing in sammy was it a great manager was it like bill graham was it a record company because this guy he definitely if you were in sammy hagar today you'd be gone in the first record because that it was a slow build with sammy it took years Right. Yeah. Uh, again, I came in on the third album, but we still weren't very big at that point, you know. Uh, but yeah, Ed Leffler was his manager. And of course, Ed went on to manage Van Halen once uh, Sammy joined Van Halen. And Ed had been a tour manager for the Beatles. Wow. So he you know, knew his way around the biz. Right. And again, he, he was the guy that knew Boston's manager and again, got us that gig, you know, opening up for them. And uh, he would put other bands on the uh, sh show with us. So as we were headlining, when we started headlining places, we would have bands that had hits on the radio and we didn't even have hits on the radio. You know, we got airplay, but not like a big hit. So we had like quarter flash. Yeah. And the, remember that. Yeah. Uh, the Scorpions opened for us. We went to England. We had Def Leppard open for us, you know, people that were bigger than us opening for us wow. you know and that that was his genius at Ed, Ed leffler that is genius because you're basically he's bringing in a band with hits and then their crowd is getting turned on to sammy that's like a that's a genius move right yeah and luckily <laughs> it all worked and uh, again uh i think we had a good rapport with all those bands you know we, we liked them in fact um we had a song that we were doing when quarter flash was was on tour with us we had a song that had a sax solo in it yeah. and we had Rindy Ross, the female vocalist sax player come out and she played with us, you know, on our song, you know? So, cause we were just friends with her and, and her husband Marv. And so uh, it, it was a great thing. Uh, they had that huge hit, uh, hard in my heart. Right. Big, big one. Yeah. That's her playing sax on that. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Let's get a little bit into Boston because Boston is one of the greatest, in my eyes, greatest 70s bands ever. I think that Tom Schultz is an absolute genius, completely underrated, uh, wrote one of, uh, two of the greatest 70s rock records ever made, invented the rock man, uh, basically a complete nutty genius. I saw Boston on the... Uh, third stage tour at Oakland Coliseum. Yeah. Uh, still, I, I tell people this, they go, who was the loudest uh, band? And I go, well, I can tell you who the loudest crowd was. It was uh -huh. Boston on the third stage. It was so loud that I thought you guys were piping in audience noise. It was <laughs> blowing my mind. And the show was insane. I even saw you guys about, I guess, 10 years ago or whatever at the... Uh, Universal Amphitheater, oh, yeah, and, and, and you're playing just dynamite and and those tunes. What was it like when you first joined Boston? Because uh, you guys go out and tour that record, and and of course now you're in Boston. And like we said, um, Amanda's a huge hit. Cool the engines is a hit, and Boston hadn't played in years. And now you're out in this giant arena tour playing these massive tunes how was that for you man well uh, to say the least it, it was uh, really special uh, uh, i was in a club band i'll, I'll go back uh, give you my history when the first boston album came out and i was driving down the street in petaluma where i was living came up to a stoplight and you know a couple of cars were at the stoplight and the guy in the car in front of me jumps out of his car runs back to my car and i recognized him he goes, hey, Gary, quick, turn on the radio. This is a band I was telling me about. They're called Boston. Put this on. And I turn it on, and it's more than a feeling. I go, wow, what a sound that is, you know. Wow. And then a couple of months later, 
I joined Sammy's band and now we're opening up for Boston. So just that alone was like, what a, a you know, mind blowing thing that was, you know? Uh, and then again, so years later, Sammy joins Van Halen, Tom Schultz calls me up to join Boston. And when we first, you know, so we finished the record, Amanda goes to number one, the record goes to number one. And Tom said, well, you know, we should do some dates, but it's been six years since the band has toured. I don't know if anybody will want to come see us. I mean, because, you know, the, the entire Beatle career, 63 yeah. through 69, was six years. Yeah. So, so you have no idea if the people that liked you then are going to like you now, right? You know? So anyway, so we, we uh, were looking around for other musicians because it was just me and Tom and uh, right. Brad. And so uh, I, I called up some of the guys I knew, and one of them were looking for a bass player, and one of them was Randy Jackson. Oh, badass. Because I'd seen him play with Journey. Yeah. And uh, so I called up Randy and I said, oh, you know, hey, we're putting the band back together and we're going to do some shows. I said, but we have no idea if anybody's going to come see this or not. Uh, so we're going to at least do 12 shows, you know, around the country. And Randy says, oh, man, I'd love to do it. But 12, I, I can't I can't commit for just 12 shows. You're going to have to find somebody else. <laughs> so. Whoa. So of course I'd love I haven't seen him since, but I'd love to run into him since. So Randy, what have you been doing since then? You know? Yeah, yeah. He just joined Journey again last week. <laughs> right, yeah. So yeah, crazy yeah. world. Yeah. Anyway, so uh so we didn't know. So we put they put the uh, shows on sale and they sold out in minutes, you know. So holy smoke. And so we're rehearsing the band, and uh we're that was when uh Tom had invented the Rockman gear. Right. So he wanted to use all Rockman gear and, and we had a half racked modules, not just the little headphone app, but right, they were, you know, yeah, the uh, Def Leppard ones. Yeah, exactly. So the rack mounted stuff, right? So we had all of that stuff and we, or any, no one had ever used this before. He just invented this. It just came out that year. Right? So we're trying to hook that together. And our crew guys had never seen this before. They had no idea what this was all about. You know, they don't have knobs like volume, treble, middle bass. It's all sliders and switches and doesn't look anything like a regular guitar amp. Plus, we took a direct send out of the back of the amp to go directly to the PA so that there'd be no speakers or oh. don't have to worry about the microphone tipping over, or moving one way. Everything was direct. And good, again, nobody had ever done that before. And so we're struggling with the trying to get make sure we got those sounds from not only the, the latest record, but also the first two records. So right. we're like working it up and, and we had four shows planned before our big show, which was going to be the Texas Jam, you know, like 80,000 people in the in the Cotton Bowl. Right. Wow. So we, we had these shows planned up like, you know, warm up shows and we had to keep canceling them. It's like, oh man, you know, the, we're not ready. The, you know, we we never played all the songs all the way through before the first show because oh. we we'd play a couple of songs and then stop. Something would break. We fix it. Change it. You know, tweak this on. You know, so you know they canceled a couple of shows. So three of the other shows. So we had one show before the Texas Jam, which was in Rochester, New York, just at the you know Civic Center there or whatever. And again, we had never played the entire set all the way through up to that point. Wow. We get there and we're doing sound check. And, and uh, when I was, again, in the opening act on the previous tour, you know, 78, 79, uh, Tom would go out to the soundboard during sound check. And he and the sound engineer would tweak things around, you know, while Tom's guitar tech would play his guitar on stage, you know, and Tom would walk around the entire stadium and have the guys move the PA so the people could, you know, could every, you know, everybody could hear it well. Wow. And of course, some of the crew hated him for that. He said, oh, man, we're going to set the PA up. He's going to have us move stuff. But you got to love the guy for wanting to make sure everybody could hear it well, you know. And so, but he would spend hours every day at soundcheck making sure everything sounded good. And so I just assumed that it was going to be the same way, you know, for, for this tour. But uh, we had hired ML ProSize, who had done, you know, ZZ Top and the Bee Gees and Paul McCartney and on and on and on, right? He's a pro guy, right? And uh, as a sound man. And so, uh, but I told ML, I said, now, Sam, uh, Tom, you know, Tom's going to come out to the soundboard and he'll be out there for sound check and he'll spend hours doing this. And, but he, Tom never did. We were so busy on stage, like trying to get the sound happening just on stage for us and the songs that Tom never went out to the soundboard. And so just before we, again, this first show, 
And Mel comes to me and said, what, what's going on? I mean, when is Tom coming out to the soundboard, you know? And I said, I don't know. And so, you know, we go to Tom and, and Tom says to ML, oh, look, ML, you're a pro. You've done this a million times. You know what we sound like. You just mix it. Go for it. You know, wow. <laughs> so we, we get on stage and, and I'm like panic because I and Tom, uh, you know, tells us just before we go on stage, he gives us the pep talk. You know, he said, look, I don't care if stuff breaks down. We're just going to keep on going. We're going to rock. Everybody, let's go out there. You know, so yeah, we run out there and start playing. And my gosh, everything worked just perfectly. Whoa. And I turned, I looked over at my sound guy, my, my guitar tech on the side of the stage. And, you know, like we got a, we're choked up going, oh man, it's, it's working, you know? And we had brought along 100 watt amps on stage just so we could hear ourselves. Again, the signal went direct to the PA. So everything was pristine out to the soundboard. But we had amps on stage so we could hear ourselves, right? I mean, and monitors on front so you could hear the vocals. But the audience was so loud, we couldn't hear our guitars. Oh. I mean, they were like singing along, screaming. It's like, we got to get bigger amps. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, and we did. We had to go out and get bigger amps because the audience was so loud, singing along and, and screaming. I'd never heard anything like it, actually. And I'm telling you, I've seen a zillion shows. I mean, I've seen some shows. And I remember you guys came on, you had that, 400 foot high pipe organ and everything yeah and you busted that out and you guys start playing and i look at my buddy and i was like hey what the fuck is going on with this audience man it yeah. was so like it was electric just <sighs> and yeah it, it was well, wild. and people ask you know after all this time of course they say, well do you get tired of playing more than a feeling and peace of mind and you know those all those songs smoking and all that I said, well, I would get tired of playing those if I just had to sit in my living room and play them, you know, every day. But you get out on stage and you look out in the audience and people are smiling and singing along, you know, again, louder than the band. I said, man, I still get choked up. It's just the best feeling in the world. Now, when you first meet um, Tom Schultz, you and uh, you two hit it off pretty hard over home recordings, I read somewhere. And later on, you uh, were recording some of the night ranger which was ranger at the time demo is correct that's right yeah when you talked to tom were you blown away by like how intricate i mean we're talking about boston one was recorded at his house right is that tape two inch tape or i mean this thing sounds insane that was one inch tape one inch Tw tape that was 12 tracks on one inch uh, a scully machine i've seen the machine of course you know yeah uh, but, uh, yeah, but he spent, you know, four or five years making it. And he always says, yeah, it took me that long to make the first record. So that's why I take a long time. You know, it just takes me a long time to, to make records. But, uh, yeah, when we, again, when I first met him in 77, when we, uh, were opening up for him, yeah, I, I went over to his pedal board and looking at his stuff and he was nice enough to tell me what he was doing. Cause I'd say, well, what's this? What does that do? How do you get that sound here? What's this thing over here? You know? And because, again, I was always into electronics myself. And, and so, again, he was nice enough to tell me what he was up to. And uh, so, yeah, I went back home. You know, now that I'm in Sammy's band, I had a little more money and bought my own recording equipment. And I had my friends come over and made demos for my friends. And so one of them, of course, was Night Ranger because Alan Fitzgerald, who was our keyboard player from Sammy's band, yep. in my mind, put together Night Ranger, you know. Yeah. And so, so we recorded a whole bunch of demos, one of which was Sister Christian, you know, as, as a demo in my living room, uh, but other friends of mine too. So again, Paul Taylor from Winger, you know, his band came over and uh, again, I brought Johnny V over and then he brought over the guys from Starship, uh, you know, Donnie Baldwin wow. on drums. And uh, so I, I, I remind my wife this, that every band that I brought over to the house to record demos went on to make platinum records like every single one of them you know wow. that's so cool that early night ranger when they were ranger and they were playing like yeah. I, I would go see them at the the guitar wars they were going up against mike varney's band cinema yeah long battle at the phoenix theater really i mix sound i make sound at that show whoa you did for, i was for, there for night ranger yeah wow. well again ranger they were just ranger but right. yeah because oh that was Petaluma. Yeah, you know, Petaluma. yeah. So they said, hey, would you come down and mix one? I said, yeah, sure. 
What what side of Petaluma did you live on? West side or east side? Just outside of town. Oh, where at? Well, right on uh, Bodega Avenue. Wow. Do you, do you remember? Well, do you remember the movie uh, American Graffiti? Of course. Uh, do you remember the scene where uh, the get kid is trying to buy liquor at the liquor store? Oh, yeah, yeah. And the yeah, big yeah. ice, the big ice machine is right there. Yeah. Well, our our house was like the next house just outside of town. It was just you know whatever the corner liquor store. I don't even remember the name of it there. Wow, that's that's a cool story, man. Yeah, a lot of rock and roll in Petaluma, dude. A lot, and Marin, of course. You know, yeah. Marin, Marin Civic Center, uh, Uncle Charlie's, New George's. Sure. All, all uh, those rooms. You know, the other advice I give to young musicians is when they say, what do I need to do to make it big? You know, I mean, what should I do? I said, well, my dad told me, it's like, do whatever you want to do in life, but be the best you can and go to school to learn how to do it. And so he said, you know, you should go to college. And if you like music, take music classes. And I thought, oh, dad, I mean, they don't teach rock and roll in college, yeah. especially back then, you know. And he said, well, but if that's what you enjoy, if you enjoy music, go. I said, okay. So he drove me over and made me enroll in Santa Rosa Junior College. Oh, yeah. And I loved it. And it wasn't because the teachers were so hip, <laughs> yeah. but they were so enthusiastic about it that I just loved doing it. And one of the chorus classes I was in, you know, all the singers there, I was sitting next to Johnny Cola, who went on to play with Huey Lewis and the Newest. So you never know who your classmates are going to be, you know. So that's the other advice I give is go to school to learn how to do it. How are you uh, li like and living in Boston compared to um, all those years in the Bay Area? Uh, gosh, now it's been as long. I've been lived in uh, Boston as long as I lived in California. So uh, both of them feel like home to me. Again, when I go out there, again, all the names of the towns and the streets and all that, uh, that feels like home. And of course, they still have relatives back there. Uh, but living here in Boston, our kids grew up here, you know, uh, for their whole lives, practically. They were born in Petaluma, but uh, moved back here right away. And so they grew up here. So they love the Northeast. So, and again, I'm from Illinois. So I remember the winters as a kid. So the, the winters don't bother me. Although driving in snow is just not much fun. Yeah, <laughs> I've got to yeah. say that. Yeah. Especially at 70 years old. <laughs> You're just like, ah. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I love both places. Now you're out there. You, of course, you're still in Boston, the band, and this we got the virus. Was there any kind of plans for Boston? Because the last time I saw you was years ago, maybe I don't know, seven years ago or something. Eight at Universal Amphitheater, you had uh, the guy from Striper in the band. You had the woman on bass who crushed it, yeah. and uh, and then the Home Depot guy singing, right? Right. Yeah. Can you, yes. Can uh, you so, do, yeah, I was going to say, so uh, Tom's original plan was to only tour when we had a new album out and that's right. what we did. So of course the albums were few and far between. So we played, actually the tour was in 87, the, the album came out in 86, but we toured in 87. The next album didn't come out till, uh, uh, I'm, yeah, 87. So the next one came out in 92 so uh or, i'm sorry 94 because we toured in 95 and 97 and then the next one didn't come out till 2002 so we toured in 2003 and four so the you know in 20 years time in the band we, you know we'd only been on tour like four times you know that's hilarious because that's when i saw you then i said yeah it was like six seven years ago <laughs> it was 2002 but well no with with the guy in striper so okay. Uh, yeah. So, unfortunately, you know, Brad took his life in 2007. It, it, uh, we did a, a, a tribute show for Brad, and we had a bunch of guys come up and sing lead. And one of them was the guy from uh, Striper, Michael Sweet, who lived locally here in Massachusetts. And he said, oh, I, you know, Boston is one of my favorite bands. I would love to sing a couple songs with you guys. And uh, we also heard about Tommy DiCarlo. He had a MySpace page on the web where he was doing karaoke, basically, to Boston songs. And somebody turned us on to us and said, check this guy out. He sounds fantastic. You got to call him up. So we call him up and find out he's never been in a band in his life. I know. And we call up and we said, gee, uh, Tommy, we want you to come sing with uh, Boston. We got this tribute show. And we can only imagine, like, he's thinking, Bobby, is this you? Who is this really? Come on. Of course. You know, who is this really? Come on. And we said, no, no, really, it's Boston. Yeah. 
come back and we want you to do this show. And so we did the show and, and uh, management said, you know, you guys could take this on the road. You know, Michael Sweet, he's a pro, been, he's got platinum albums of his own, you know, with Striper. And this guy, Tommy DiCarlo, you guys should take both of them out. And that's what we did for uh, 2008. We toured. And that's again, I saw it. Yeah, they were the greatest. And you might think that. Uh, so here's a, a, a guy never been on stage in his life. You know, Tommy DiCarlo, never been in a band. And then Michael Sweet, you know, the ultimate rock star, you know, platinum albums, toured around the world, you know, they got along great. Michael was the nicest guy, a real mentor to Tommy. And it was so great to see, you know. And one day, uh, uh, Michael said, we got to get you some new clothes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Tommy comes back and he's got some cool looking stuff. And, and one of them is some ripped jeans, you know, and, and Tommy goes, man, the last time I wore ripped jeans, I was eight years old. <laughs> oh, my God. Let me ask you something about Tommy. Um, now, I've always had this question because I sang all my life. And, of course, you can sing. If you, if you can mimic someone at a karaoke, that's, you know, five minutes. But when you're on a tour singing a couple hours a night, what kind of preparation did he have to do? Did he start taking vocal lessons for endurance as far as like longevity? Did he understand the dynamics of, of in-house monitors or in-ear monitors? How did that all go down? He definitely took lessons. Uh, on that first tour, uh, he was doing great and trading off with Michael. Right. But we got to um, Red Rocks out in Colorado and it's, you know, 6,000 feet up. Right. Yeah. And people warned us. He said, now drink a lot of water. It's really dry up there at 6,000 feet and you don't have as much oxygen. And yeah, Tommy was starting to lose his voice. You're like, he just, ah, you know, it wasn't happening for him. Luckily we had Michael there, you know, to, to fill in right. and because the guys could, could trade off. But uh, Tommy said, man, I, I don't ever want to have that happen again. What do I got to do? And so he contacted a guy, um, I can't think of his name now, but a vocal coach right. and, and uh, got a lot of good tips. And so now he's a fanatic. He doesn't talk during the day. You know, he wants to save the voice and drinks a lot of water and warms up before and cools down afterwards. And he's got a whole routine to do it right. And he's been terrific ever since. Just think that guy's life. You know, uh, we've seen the movie with it. It happened with Judas Priest. It happened with Journey. And uh, Mark Wahlberg did the movie, Rockstar. Right. But imagine, I don't know, what was the guy in his late, fo early 40s, late 40s, when he gets discovered for Boston? I mean, wh how old was he? Yeah, yeah, he must have been like, yeah, mid-40s, I think. So, so imagine you're working at Home Depot, and then all of a sudden you're touring with Boston, and you're yeah. a singer. I mean, and you're, you're not playing nightclubs. You're playing arenas and giant theaters and stuff that had to be insane yeah festivals of course we'd be on you know a bunch of shows and yeah, yeah. so uh, i'm sure it was uh, maybe overwhelming for him but you know because everybody else in the band uh had been around for a while right you know we're not kids yeah. anymore either you know of course. so uh and of course no drugs you know in the band uh, you know f from day one you know with tom so uh that, you know, I, I think that really uh, helped to, you know, to smooth things over. And again, Michael Sweet, again, just the nicest guy. And uh, again, of course, a Christian guy. And so was right. Tommy. So they kind of had that in common. And and so, yeah, I, I think if anything, that was the, probably the smoothest transition you could ever hope for. And Tommy's married, you know, got a couple of kids. And so he was, you know, definitely settled. He knew who he was as a person. And then it was just like, okay, here's the gig. And, and according, uh, you know, he just tells us, you know, how thankful he is to have that opportunity. No, that's just such a, such a mind blower to me, you know, because like I sometimes sing, uh, I do a tribute to Bon Scott once a year, uh, uh -huh. ACDC, and it's a big star studded thing here in LA. And people are always like, you should be the singer, man. You know? And it's like, yeah. what people don't understand is to sing one night, is is you know pretty pretty hard but you can you can get ready to do it but to sing at 120 db vo stage volume i don't know if you guys are using in-ears now but 
you know, to sing every night and, and, and these songs, especially when you weren't a singer for the first 30 years of your life. Yeah. Uh, it's such a, such a game changer, man. You know? Yeah. Uh, gosh, I remember seeing Bon Scott, uh, we did some gigs again when I was in Sammy's band, we opened up for ACDC a few times with Bon and yeah, they were terrific back in the day. Oh, did you ever talk to Bon? No, never did. Uh, briefly talked to the other guys. Uh, and, but you know, not much really, but, uh, it, it was great to see him. I, and as it turned out, when I was talking to him, I, I said, you know, I saw you guys play Wolfgang's yeah, club Wolfgang's. Yeah, 77. In, in San Francisco. Uh, and they said, oh, yeah, that was our first gig in the U.S. Yeah, you know, it was. Like, so I, I was there. And, you know, again, they were just amazing. And, you know, Bon Scott's got, uh, uh, um, you know, Angus on his shoulders and running around the stage. And, and Chris is Angus, is, you know, doing the headbang thing. It's like snot coming out of his nose. And he's just a wild man up there. You know, it was fantastic. What drove you to see the gig? Were you an ACDC fan or were you just hanging at Wolfgang's because it was so hot? Or, or it was old Waldorf, actually. Um, were you there just going because you would hang at old Waldorf? Uh, somebody had told us that they were, you know, gr this great band was coming. So we said, right. okay, hey, let's go. Let's check it out. See what it and so, yeah, well, from that day forward, you know, we were all big ACDC fans from that day. What kind of gear you got now? You, do you have a bunch of gear? Or are you one of those guys that sold it off and just play a couple things? Uh, were you playing Parker Fly for a while, or what was that guitar? Uh, Steinberger. Stein, oh, awesome. awesome. Now, they, uh, so, well, I'll, I'll go back. So, yeah, I started on SGs because that was, you know, favorite guitar. And then when I was in Sammy's band, uh, I met Grover Jackson, who was just starting his own company at that time. He, had, of course, had Charvel. Right, but there was he was splitting off, and I met him in L.A. and uh, I said, "Well, I, I like double cutaways." He says, "Well, I got this thing I've been calling the Dinky Strat, but it's a double cutaway." And so I said, "Oh, that's great!" So he, you know, gave me one of those, and I took it on the road, and it got stolen off the side of the stage in Detroit. Whoa! Why you're playing right after the show? Like, oh. and and it was a security person. They said, "Oh yeah, we saw the guy like run out the back door." Wow! And so I I called up Grover. I said, "Oh man, I, I hate to say this, but the guitar, you know, got stolen. Could you make me a couple more?" And uh, and I said, "But this time, could you put on twenty four frets? Because the other one just had twenty. Oh, okay, sure." So he he makes this guitar that they then call the soloist. The next thing I know, I see Jeff Beck's playing a pink one. And I said, oh, man, that's and with 24 frets, you know. So uh, I played those for many years all the way through into Boston. And then uh, we were in Nashville, and that's where Gibson was located. And they had bought Steinberger. And I went over to the factory to take a look at what was going on over there at Gibson and then Steinberger. And they said, well, we got this new guitar that has a headstock, Steinberger with a headstock and with tuners on it. And I said, wow, that's pretty cool. And so uh, I started playing those. And so I played those for many years. And now uh, I'm on to uh, PRS. Oh, and, great. Great company, man. And, of course, we met uh, Paul back, you know, in uh, Maryland. when I, Again, when I was in Sammy's band, he was just starting off. And he brought us some guitars. And, wow, these look fantastic, you know. But whatever, we didn't, didn't buy any at the time. But uh, so I, I love those now. So, I, yeah, I get that. And then for amps, of course. Uh, we use all the Rockman gear, you know, the still. same stuff, the same, you know, it's made in 1987. We're still using the same stuff, you know, and it still wow. works. Wow. But uh, me personally, I like to uh, work on and rebuild old tube amps. Oh, cool. So, so like, what are I, you into? like super reverbs and stuff like that or well, uh, amps? Yeah. The, all, that era, all that, you know, that 50, 60 stuff. So, uh, I've done some other outside projects like uh, All 41 and Alliance. Uh, and so I usually use an amp that I've built. Oh. So uh, <laughs> you're probably not really into tube amps. But oh, like I love tube amps. You're talking to the wrong, right guy, dude. I'm, oh, okay. I'm, a, I'm, I'm an AC-15 freak. I oh. absolutely love EL-34s. Uh, you know, I'm into, I, I love uh, the Tweed 59 four input uh, deluxes. Uh, yeah. Low powered supers. Oh, come on. Man. Well, way back in the early days of Fender, they used to use octal tubes. And a lot of times they were metal. I don't know if you remember seeing that stuff, you know, 
uh, octal meaning just eight pins as opposed to the nine pins that have that are 12 AX7s right. for preamps or the, again, the EL84s for power amp. Right. So I went way back, I was looking at some of those. So the S or six SJ7 pantode tubes were in some of the early Gibson and Fender amps. So I, I built an amp with one of those in it. You know, again, the early Champ and Deluxe had those pentode tubes in them. And they're just a different sound. So anyway, I, I built some of those. And, and uh, again, I'll, I'll find some old amp online on eBay or something. And that doesn't work. I said, that's dead, you know, and I'll buy that and fix it up and play that. So that's, it's been a lot of fun for me. Wow. And then no, no plans, of course, of touring with Boston, right? Well, uh, again, as I said, we had usually only toured when we had a new album out. But once, uh, you know, we did the tour in, in 2008, and people said, you guys should come back, you know. So, uh, again, that was with the Michael Sweet. So then we toured again in 2012. And Tom said, you know, this is a lot of fun. We should do this more often. And, again, people don't want to hear your new stuff anyway. They want to hear the old songs, you know. Oh, God. So, Especially Boston. I mean, you know, it's like, it's like, it's, it's like seeing the cars. There's no piss tracks. It's hit after yeah. hit after hit. Yeah. So we toured in 2014, 15, 16, 17, four years in a row. And the band had never played that much in the whole history. Right. And so, but after four years on the road, Tom said, you know, we should take some time off. So we took two years off, you know, uh, uh, 18 and 19. And then the pandemic hit. So, you know, so, well, we're not going out this year. Yeah. And so I, uh, and I, of course, you know, we'd ask Tom, well, Tom, do you ever think you might want to retire? He said, no way. You know, I want to keep going until wow. I drop, you know? So uh, I hope we go out next year, but Hey, unless they come up with a vaccine or something happens. Yeah. I, yeah. I don't know how we could do it. How about your uh, hands and everything? All good at 69 years old. Luckily. Yes. Uh, I'm fine. And uh, I was always a runner, you know, so i <laughs> I weigh the same as I did in high school, you know? Yeah, so you're like nine feet tall and a stick. <laughs> you always had well, that cool haircut. You looked like straight seventies, like almost kind of punk rock, you know? Yeah. Well, yeah. When, uh, when the whole punk thing happened, we, we were in England. As I said, we went to England to record that album in 77 and the sex pistols were top of the charts, you know? So we cut our hair short and came back to the U S and nobody had short hair like that, like us. <laughs> And I remember we did a gig with Ted Nugent and Ted goes, man, what's with the hair? What do you, who are you guys, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I so remember your Rand Randall lad, you had completely short hair. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so uh, well, maybe we should grow our hair back along. <laughs> That's so but uh, yeah, but yeah, those were the days. You, uh, in between Boston, were you a able just to kind of live on money from that or were you working gigs? I worked at Scholl's Research with Tom, uh, again, because I knew a little bit about electronics because, you know, I had built actually, you know, some tube preamps and other stuff and, and some switching gear that Sammy used to use on stage. And, and so, uh, actually, when I was still in Sammy's band, uh, I don't know if you know about the NAM show. That's the course, Nas I know, yeah, yeah. National Association of Music Merchandisers that they have usually two times a year, one in L.A., now the other one is in uh, Nashville, but it used to be in Chicago, uh, so twice a year. And that's where all the manufacturers would show off all their new gear. So Tom had uh, actually was the bass rockman that came out in, the, I'm trying to think what year that was, probably 83 or something like that. And again, because I had known him and we'd kept in touch over the years, he said, gee, would you come down to the NAMM show in LA and play guitar and bring along a bass player? And, and show off our stuff. He said, cause I, you know, I'm kind of tired of doing it. To tell you the truth. You know, I, I go to the shows and I play the stuff and oh, it's, you know, it's, Man, it's eight it's hours growing. a day. Yeah. yeah. So he said, could you do that? So I, I did that. And so we kept in touch. So, yeah. So, so when I joined the band, uh, he had said, okay, well, we're going to make the record. And if you could go to the trade shows for me, cause they're not only the, the NAM shows, but there are other trade shows. He said, if you could do that kind of stuff. And he knew that I was a photographer because he had seen some of the stuff I had done. And so he said, yeah, maybe if you could take pictures of the products, that'd be great. And so, but one of the first things, almost as soon as I got there was, uh, so it was December. Uh, and he said, we got this NAM show in January. So we're working on this new products, you know, this sustainer, you know, this preamp. And he, so he said, would you come down to the office and take a listen to it? 
and you know tell us what you think all right and so i go down there and all the other engineers are musicians too so we're all sitting around playing and talking about it and and the, and he's got like about a half a dozen prototypes sitting around and so we all talk about say okay that's good okay we'll make this change we're going to change this capacitor this resistor this thing over here and so the guys including tom they start soldering away chains and stuff and i said well look i know how to solder here give me a soldering iron you know yeah. so we're all just starting changing this stuff and and I went to the trade show and uh, then well, I, you know, come back from that and so many people love the thing at the trade show that they put in orders. And so Tom said, gee, could you come in and make sure that we've got the sound right and help out? So I just started going to the office every day and pretty soon I got my own desk and, <laughs> you know, because I, again, I knew about a bit about how the thing was put together and helped with the testing of it. And then taking pictures of the product and pretty soon, you know, I'm working there full time. So, so yeah, so that's, that's what I did. Wow. Wow. That's great. So it's either you're either working in Boston or you're, you're working, putting together stuff for uh, amps, you know, that, amps. that I love doing. Yeah. And I, I got to say, Chris, our kids were growing up at that time. And I think that helped them to see like, well, gee, even you're in a big band, you're playing at arenas and yeah. these festivals. But you still go to work every day, you know. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I, I hope, and, and of course, I think our t our kids turned out great. But uh, but they could see like, oh, it doesn't matter what kind of you know rock star you think you are, you're still going into work. <laughs> yeah, of course. But I, again, I loved what I was doing. You ever talk to Sammy anymore? Oh yeah, yeah. I was just out at his place uh, in February. Uh, again, I was always. Uh, into photography and video. And my sister was a filmmaker, actually. Uh, I don't know if you remember the old art film called Koyanis Katsi. No. Uh, Philip Glass did it and, and Francis Ford Coppola distributed it. It was a, an artsy kind of movie. Anyway, so I, I learned video and, and filmmaking from her just a little bit. Anyway, uh, so uh, during this time off, these last couple of years, uh, Boston had a bunch of video that we had, that had been shot over all the years, way back from the seventies sitting, you know, in, uh, in a storage. And I said, Tom, you know, we should digitize this stuff so that it doesn't disappear because, you know, tape will deteriorate and we've had oh, that yeah. problem with audio tape. Of course. So, so he said, well, you know how to do that? I said, yeah, I can, I can do that. So anyway, I spent months and months digitizing all the old Boston footage that we had. And I was, telling this to Sammy because, you know, Sammy and I talk every once in a while and he said, Hey, what are you doing? So it's, well, I'm just finishing up this big project here with, you know, digitizing all the Boston video. And uh, he said, Oh man, that's just what I need. Would you come out here and do that for me? Wow. And I said, okay, sure. You know, so I, w I went out to his studio and spent three weeks day and night digitizing stuff uh, again, back from the Hagar days when I was in the band. Whoa. And then That's Van Halen, weird, right? You're just watching yourself from like the '70s, you know? Yeah, just yeah. That, that fire in your guys' eyes and that whole thing has got to be wild. Yeah. So that, and then Van Halen stuff, and then the Waburitos stuff. So it was a lot of fun to to see all that. Is there any footage from the Boston uh, "Don't Look Back" day in the green? I didn't find that. No, Damn. Uh, there, there's that, yeah, that stuff is few and far between because people just, you know, they didn't videotape a whole lot back then well, or, Bill, or Bill film. filmed everything. So all the day on the greens are filmed, which is amazing. Yeah. Whatever it is, we don't have that. So I think, right. but yeah, I think Bill has that stuff, but, right. but we don't personally, but it's out there. Some stuff, stuff is stuff is out there. Luckily. How about Bill church? You ever talked to Bill church? Yes. Uh, as a matter of fact, when I was out at Sammy's place uh, here in February, uh, Sammy said, hey, let's call Bill. Yeah. And so so we were chatting with Bill and and uh, you're right. Yeah, he's living in Fresno. And he said, oh, yeah, I, I should come up and see you guys. But as a matter of fact, my son, who's he's in, in a, a band. band. Yeah. He said he was just in Italy and he's flying home. I got to meet him at the airport. And so and I was about to leave the next day or something. So I said, oh, I'll, I'll miss you then. But uh, his son's you know. band's good, man. They're like yeah. uh, desert rock, you know? Oh, uh, yeah. Well, I got to I got to tell you, man, um, a buddy of mine, Craig Bearhorse, posted up. Uh, let me read it to you real quick, and then I'll, I'll cut you loose. Uh, yesterday, like I said, I've seen Sammy 
every tour, even HSAS. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, and so, you know, Craig posts up this amazing post, and it said, 40 years ago today, at the right age of 14, I was hanging at Day Under Green 1. A friend of mine slapped a backstage pass on me, went up on stage and took photos. And there was this photo. I don't know if you can see me, but this is a photo of you. Oh, yeah. yeah. And wow. And you're back, you're in the background there? I'm not in the background. My buddy, oh. my, I, was in the front, I was in the front row during this show, actual front row. I was wow. in the front row for that show. And yeah. uh, there's Bill Church. Yeah. You know? And, of course, there's, uh, there's Sammy with that red Explorer when he painted it and that jumpsuit. Yeah, right. And uh, there it was, Chuck Ruff on drums. Oh, and, I, and I thought, you know, I got to get Gary on the show, man. I just think that uh, that band was very electric and so Bay Area flavored. And and your look and your vibe and everything was just the ultimate as a uh, – Sammy couldn't have got a better guy. That's all oh, to it. Well, thanks so much. Uh, again, I really enjoyed my eight years in that band. And, uh, again, Sammy was just the greatest guy to work for because always in a good mood. And, you know, he was – as I say, he was our cheerleader and, and kept us going – when things didn't always go so well, because those early days, you know, we'd go on tour and we'd, we'd get off a tour, we'd be broke, you know? Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, he always, uh, you know, tried to keep us working as much as possible, which we loved anyway, you know? So yeah, right. it, it all worked out. Real quick question before we go out of those three drummers in Sammy's band, uh, who was the best that you thought? Was it Carmasi, Denny or what? No, they're all different. Uh, as all drummers are, and you'd think, well, they're just playing the same beat, you know, two and four, you know, nah. how could that be different? But no, everybody is different. And, and they're all great guys to work with. Uh, and certainly I've known Dave Lauser the longest here now. Uh, sadly, Chuck Ruff, of course, passed away a couple of years ago. Uh, I got to see him just before he, he did pass away, he had liver problems or something and Damn. poor guy. But yeah, all of them were terrific players and, and great to work with. And, they were, uh, again, also thoughtful about what they were playing. Uh, and that, you know, again, that just raises the whole level of the band. You know, when you know that everybody else is like trying their best and thinking about it, then how can we make this better? You know, that, that vibe. And that was, that was always the case in that band. Yeah, that's true. You guys, you guys had it, man. You and Bill Church, the Electric Church, man. Uh, what, what, a, what a band and you guys are definitely a huge part of the Bay Area music history. You know, I, I think it's so important to talk to the people that, of course, it's, it's, it's great to have a Sammy on or a Tom Schultz, but let's talk to these other guys, you know, how about these guys that were the part of the, uh, you know, machine, you know, and, and the grueling part of it too. I mean, thank God, Sammy took care of you guys uh, while you were playing, but there's so many guys that are just uh, dust that were really part of rock history. Yeah. I, again, I've been very fortunate uh, over the years to be in the right place at the right time, you know, and, and have some great guys to work with. Uh, certainly Sammy and Tom Scholes, that they are such wonderful mentors to us. You know, they're, they're actually both a little older than me. And they had been around and knew what they wanted, you know, like they had a vision and were just trying their best to, to make that happen. Yeah. And uh, I, I'll, I'll give you one other quick uh, story here. So uh, way back in the early 70s, uh, again, when I was playing in Fox, we met a guy named Gideon Daniels, who was a, a black gospel singer. And uh, we were on a real small record label called you know, Studio 10 Records. And the, the owner there found this guy, Gideon, and said, hey, this guy is great. You guys should talk to him. And we actually uh, had him come out and sing with us for a couple of songs. We, and it's like straight old time gospel stuff, which is really the roots of rock and roll, right? I mean, this is like oh, before right. the blues. This is Absolutely. before the blues was gospel, you know? And so this guy was doing that straight old time, dum -ba, dum -ba, dum -ba, in that resurrection morning when the trumps and got you sound. I mean, like all that stuff, you know? And so he was putting together a gospel band and, and Johnny uh, joined them for a while on bass. 
I played guitar with him. And one of the singers he got was a local guy named Mickey Thomas. Oh, wow. Uh, wow. Yeah, it, Starship. Exactly. So Elvin it was Bishop. right. So it was Mickey and Bobby Castro and Ross Hayashida were three vocalists. That's all they did were just vocals. And they were all fantastic. I mean, he, each one of those guys was as good as Mickey. And then Gideon, who was better than everybody. And then a small band, you know, either a keyboard player, like we had Melvin Seals on organ for a oh, while. Wow. And, uh, you know, cause he played the foot bass stuff, you know. Oh, yeah. he was just terrific. Foot pedals, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so straight old-timey gospel stuff. But it was so much fun to play and learn that stuff. And then, uh, as it turned out, Gideon started sharing an apartment with Elvin Bishop. And Elvin would come to our shows and see us and so sometimes sit in with us. And that's when he found Mickey, hired Mickey for his band, and the, you know, the rest of his history from Mickey. But Mickey always talks about Gideon to say, oh, yeah, he was a great mentor to us. I mean, he taught, he said, Gideon taught me how to be on stage, you know, and because Gideon was just the master. Right. Anyway, I just had to include that because a guy awesome. that you don't hear about. Yeah. 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 Is Fitz still alive? He is. We talked to him just last year. Because uh, we were putting together another Alliance album, yeah, and and we said Fitz, you know, we, we'd love to have you play on this one because he he played on the first uh, three with us, and he said, oh man, I've been on the road with uh, Dan Fogelberg, and of course he'd been on the road with Van Halen playing wow. keys off stage. Oh, he was, wow, yeah, and a uh, bunch of other people. Springsteen, of course, he he was on the road with Springsteen for many years. He was what era? Uh, ooh, gee, well, over the last 10 years, he wasn't playing off stage because they didn't need him for doing that, but he was like, you know, key tech, he was keyboard tech. Oh, I got you. Wow. Wow. So, so he, so he said, man, I am burnt. <laughs> you know, I need some time off, you know, call me next year or something, you know, but I, I thanks anyway, but I can't do it. But, uh, Fitz he was, was, he was badass and, and gamma and, and ranger, you know? Oh yeah, sure. Yeah. A terrific player. Yeah. Well, hey, man, I can't thank you enough. And uh, I don't know if you have an Instagram or a Twitter or anything, but if you do, promote it uh, now. And if not, I'll send you over this. Uh, I'll text you this link for the show. It'll be out tomorrow. Okay, great. Well, thanks so much for having me. I really enjoyed talking about the old days. I hope it didn't uh, bore you or, or your listeners too much. Oh, no, it lived up to its expectations, brother. <laughs> I, uh, I, uh, like I said, there's so many people in my early life that I really learned a lot about rock and roll from, you know, you, I would say Brad Gillis, I would yeah. say Fitz, uh, Fitz, even though I'm not a keyboard player, I realized there must be something about Fitz for him to be in all these different bands, always the go-to man, you know, and uh, yeah. I'm sure it was work ethic and playing or whatever, but I learned a lot from the Bay Area. All my musical uh, knowledge is from watching you guys. Uh, well, thanks so much for having me, and that uh, we sure appreciate your support over all this time. Yeah, how about that Cow Palace, huh? I, I never got to play there, and I still uh, dream of playing in that iconic room, man. Yeah, yeah. Maybe not the greatest sound, but it no. had a vibe to yeah. it, huh? Well, that's what it's about. It's horrible, so, you know. But man, when you walked into that venue, you knew you were going to see a rock concert, man. Yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right, buddy. Thank you so much, man. And uh, hopefully I'll meet you one day in person uh, when I get back to touring as a comedian. Are you a comedy fan? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, all the, all the great comics are out of Boston, you know. Bill Burr, yeah. of course. Um, that's a great area for comedy. Yeah, sure. And certainly, if I'm ever coming through town, let me know, and I'd love to invite you down the show so we can actually shake hands and you can meet the rest of the band here, too. Oh, God, that'd be great. Thank you so much, man. Yeah, you're welcome, and thanks for having me. I'll see you later. Right. Bye. Bye.